Uh, let me start off by welcoming uh, Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh. He is from HealthWatch USA. He is board chairman of HealthWatch USA. He is the associate editor for the Journal of Patient Safety and editorial board member of Infection Control Today. He serves on CMS's Hospital Acquired Condition Reduction Program Technical Expert Panel and on NQS Consensus Standards Approval Committee. And he is going to talk to us today about tracing the history of the ineffective infectious disease policy regarding the USA's attempt to stop the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Cavanaugh. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to talk to you today about the perfect storm COVID-19, tracing the history of ineffective disease policy. It should be noted that in this presentation, I will stress the importance of evidence-based strategies and maintaining an infectious disease infrastructure in the prevention of emerging epidemics. This presentation is the express opinion of myself and not that of HealthWatch USA. In 2005, President George Bush stated, a pandemic is a lot like a forest fire. If caught early, it might be extinguished with limited damage. If allowed to smolder undetected, it can grow to an inferno that spreads quickly beyond our ability to control it. And with these words, he requested $7.1 billion to fund the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act. This act became law on December 19, 2006. The act created much of the United States infectious disease infrastructure, including the creation of funding of BARDA, which is the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. The act created key positions in the Department of Health and Human Services for pandemic preparedness and response, and it provided funding for pandemic response supplies, which were housed in the National Strategic Stockpile. In 2009, the N1H1 pandemic hit the United States. 85 million N95 respirators were distributed from the stockpile. By 2020, only 12 million N95 masks were available, along with another 5 million out-of-date masks. It was evident our stockpile was never replenished. It was predicted that we would need at least 3.5 billion masks to address a severe pandemic. Before the COVID-19 pandemic hit Singapore, Singapore had almost three N95 masks stockpiled for every resident. However, the United States would depend upon the free market for the equipment and supplies needed for the COVID-19 pandemic, but our manufacturing capabilities had largely been outsourced to China. To compound this problem, many facilities had a just-in-time three to seven day supply chain. As aptly pointed out by Rosemary Gibson in her book, China Rx, we are almost totally dependent on China for our medications and medication precursors. Unfortunately, the same is also true for our medical supplies and medical devices. One of Ms. Gibson's videos was posted on HealthWatch USA's website Below it was a comment which was left by a Chinese pharmaceutical worker. The comment stated, Okay, the Chinese did not put a gun to U.S. pharma manufacturers' heads and say, Move all your production to China. U.S. pharma wanted 3,000% margins and also did not want to pay U.S. workers and technicians. Believe me, none of the savings are passed on to the patient. Around the same time, President Trump placed tariffs on China which may have preemptively helped us respond to supply chain disruptions. In the spring of 2018, the United States pandemic response team was disbanded. The responsibilities were largely assigned to other agencies. When a rumor surfaced about this in 2020, it seemed so unbelievable, it prompted a Snoops investigation. Unfortunately, Snoops verified that the rumor was true. In September 2018, before the Presidential Advisory Committee for Combating Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria, HealthWatch USA advocated for the formulation of firm standards and policies for patients, healthcare workers, and their families regarding acquisitions of dangerous pathogens. Currently, only MRSA and C. difficile, which occur in acute care hospitals, are mandatorily reportable on a national or federal basis. 
and MRSA is only reportable for bloodstream infections. At a minimum, we need routine testing to identify carriers and a mandatory national reporting system for all dangerous pathogens, not just COVID-19, and this system should be enforced for all types of healthcare facilities. We echoed these concerns in the Journal of Antimicrobial Resistance and Infection Control, along with advocating for surveillance and an economic and healthcare safety net for all healthcare workers. We feel the United States needs to go further in our infection control prevention strategies. Currently, the United States focuses on hand hygiene as the primary mechanism to prevent spread of dangerous pathogens. However, in our view, hand hygiene should be regarded as a backup measure, since these pathogens should not be on a healthcare worker's hands in the first place. And if they are, there has been a breakdown in containment and control. Finally, the CDC has limited statutory authority in addressing pathogens and making change. The CDC can mainly perform advice and set recommendations and can only go into a facility when invited. Then in 2019, the CDC recommended enhanced barrier precautions for nursing homes. However, these precautions were a lower standard of care than standard precautions, and they were advocated for use with Candida auris, CRE, and MRSA, along with other dangerous pathogens. These precautions did not require isolation of nursing home residents who were carriers of these pathogens. The resident carriers could wander around the nursing home and engage in normal activities. The healthcare worker was only required to wear gowns, masks, and gloves when engaging resident carriers with activities which were deemed to have a high risk of transmission. But even lower risk activities, such as passing meds, occurred so frequently that we felt there was a significant risk of exposure. The Public Health Service Act and CDC regulations do permit the federal government to take additional actions deemed necessary to prevent interstate spread of communicable diseases if state and local responses are inadequate, but the extent of this authority has never been tested. However, the recent declaration of the CDC to mandate that renters are not to be evicted because evictions may spread infections raises the possibility that the CDC has more regulatory power than previously thought. The justification given was the CDC's director's authority to take measures that are reasonably necessary to mitigate the spread of communicable diseases. Some now believe the CDC could mandate a national reporting system. Many have stated no one could have predicted this pandemic, but nothing could be further from the truth. We had MERS, SARS, Ebola, and with Ebola we learned we had shortages of PPE. And there was a book written by Lawrence Wright entitled The End of October, which was published in April of 2020. This book described a severe pathogen emerging out of China, a virus which caused a pandemic and spread across the United States, causing an economic collapse and wreaked havoc and confusion on our healthcare system. It foretold much of what we are going through today. In October of 2019, there was an enactment of a pandemic scenario called Crimson Contagion. This scenario laid out in stark detail repeated cases of confusion in the exercise. Federal agencies jockeyed over who was in charge. State officials and hospitals struggled to figure out what kind of equipment was stockpiled or available. And cities and schools went their own ways on school closings. This scenario went unheeded, but accurately predicts what we are going through today. The United States had an erosion of its infrastructure for infectious disease. According to the OECD, the United States had a progressive decrease over the years in hospital beds per capita. And this reduction, as of 2018, we were in the lower one third of industrialized nations for hospital beds. The CDC also had a progressive decrease in funding over a number of years. It was even slated for reduction in 2020. 
the CDC had to roll back much of their foreign presence. In 2017, the CDC had approximately 47 staffers in their office in China. By 2020, staffing was reduced to approximately 14, with the loss of epidemiologists and other healthcare professionals. We had lost most of our eyes and ears on the ground and were dependent upon other countries and agencies for much of our information. On January 14, 2020, the WHO tweeted, preliminary investigations conducted by Chinese authorities were found to have no clear evidence of human-to-human -human transmission of the novel coronavirus. This probably resulted in a sigh of relief in the general public and our government. And then the virus appeared in the Pacific Northwest. The CDC and Director Robert Redford were put in charge. On January 28th, Director Redfield sent a memo which stated, while we believe the novel 2019 coronavirus poses a very serious public health threat, the virus is not spreading in the United States at this time, and the CDC believes the imminent health risk from the 2019 novel coronavirus to the general public is low. A day later, on January 29th, Peter Navarro, a top White House advisor, sent a memo to the White House warning that the novel coronavirus was highly infectious and can cause severe economic disruptions in the United States, and the virus had an R naught of between three to five, similar to the bubonic plague, polio, and smallpox. Now, an R naught is the infectivity of a pathogen where an R naught of three means that on average, every three people with the disease will spread it to three other people. With the virus having an R naught of three to five, it is hard to believe that person to person spread had not been detected earlier and that this virus was not aerosolized. President Trump responded by placing travel bans on China. Initially, he was widely criticized for this, with many stating it would not be effective. However, in April, when CNN reported on Taiwan's response, Taiwan's success was partially attributed to enacting early travel bans on China. Most public health care experts agree the initial travel ban was beneficial in buying time to gear up for the pandemic. But a ban was not placed on Europe until much later allowing the virus to enter the northeastern United States, which wreaked havoc on New York City and Boston. And unfortunately, the time these travel bans bought us was largely squandered. Bob Woodward has released tapes of interviews of President Trump. On February 7th, President Trump stated, It goes through the air, Bob, the air you just breathe. And that is how it is passed. It is also more deadly, even your strenuous flus. This is more deadly. This is 5% versus 1% and less than 1%. This is deadly stuff. On March 19th, he stated, to be honest with you, I wanted always to play it down. I still like playing it down because I do not want to cause a panic. So it was known that this virus is also more deadly than even your strenuous flus and that the response was being played down to not cause panic. Now, despite this concern that the virus may be spreading through the air, the use of masks by the public was discouraged. The Surgeon General tweeted to the public on February 29th, to stop buying masks, that masks were not effective in preventing the general public from catching the virus, and that they were needed for healthcare professionals. Granted, the United States had a severe mask shortage. At one point, the CDC even recommended that as a last resort, one could wear a bandana. Initially, N95 masks were not recommended for all COVID-19 patient encounters, and the risk to the healthcare worker of not wearing an N95 mask was downplayed. The CDC reversed their stance regarding the public wearing masks when it was realized that between 40 to 45% of infections were asymptomatic or presymptomatic, 
and that these carriers caused a substantial amount of infections, possibly up to 50% of these transmissions. Thus, wearing a mask is not so much to protect the wearer, but if the wearer is an unknown carrier, it will help to protect others. On February 26, 2020, the CDC held a telebriefing which warned of severe disruptions to our communities and way of life. Communities needed to plan for school closings and even for teleschooling. This stark warning caused the stock market to crash and the White House immediately walked back the statements causing the warning to go largely unheeded. Testing was another problem. Initially, the federal government decided to not use the WHO test, which was developed in Germany, and to have the CDC develop the test to be used in the United States. Unfortunately, the CDC's test was found to be defective and had to be recalled, resulting in a shortage of testing and a very narrow testing criteria. We did not have enough tests to detect community spread and as a result, the virus spread undetected throughout the United States. The CDC then became noticeably absent from the podium of presidential briefings and news conferences. It was felt that this may have been due to the alarm they sounded regarding the pandemic and the missteps with testing. However, the CDC was needed. They were the one agency which has boots on the ground and firsthand knowledge of how to handle pandemics. Even the White House's Coronavirus Task Force was largely sidelined and silenced during a significant portion of our response. Because of the need for increased testing, the FDA responded by allowing the marketing of antibody tests without thorough review and evaluation. Hopes of opening the economy were placed on identification of immune individuals. Hundreds of different tests flooded the market. However, Europe and the CDC found these tests not to be accurate, having a very high false positive rate, and less than half of the positive antibody test results were correct. The FDA reversed course 50 days after initial approval and tightened standards. Currently, we are still having a myriad of tests, many of which require specific reagents and supplies, which greatly increases the complexity of our supply chain. There was also misinformation spreading that masks and social distancing were not effective, despite the United States' past experience in the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. As can be seen in this diagram, in 1918, Philadelphia had a large spike in the number of daily deaths compared to the flat curve of St. Louis. St. Louis acted early and implemented closures and social distancing. Philadelphia did not. In addition, the president gave confusing messages that seemed to support demonstrators who were protesting state closures while some of the demonstrators were banishing semi-automatic weapons. The president tweeted, liberate Minnesota, liberate Michigan, liberate Virginia, and that your Second Amendment rights are under siege. And early on, a Fox News commentator even called the epidemic a hoax. False information was spreading widely on the internet. A Carnegie Mellon University found that nearly half of the accounts tweeting about the coronavirus were likely bots. These bots seemed to follow the playbooks of propaganda machines of Russia and Chinese governments. This was confirmed by a Reuters report, which described a European Union document detailing how a Russian disinformation campaign was pushing online fake news. The fake news was in multiple languages, making it harder for the EU to communicate its pandemic response. And some of this news was just bizarre. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation created and released this virus, that Pope Francis tested positive for the coronavirus, that Vice President Mike Pence was telling people to go to the police if infected, and without evidence that the coronavirus is a Chinese bioweapon. There was the assumption that this virus respected geographic boundaries, it was felt that large outbreaks could only happen in the Northeast or major cities. But look at what happened in Kentucky. Early on, the major outbreak in our state was in rural Warren and surrounding rural counties. During a COVID-19 Senate hearing, Dr. Fauci stated, 
We cannot focus on those areas of the country having a surge. It places the entire country at risk. So the whack-a-mole approach of a reactive regional strategy may quell an outbreak, but we need a proactive uniform national strategy to prevent outbreaks and to prevent viral spread. There was mixed messaging regarding masks. This policy was not being promoted by all. The president felt the wearing of masks was voluntary. In early June, the president toured a manufacturing plant in Maine, which manufactured swabs for use in COVID-19 testing. He did not wear a mask. A semi-sterile environment was required with employees wearing masks, coats, booties, and hairnets. Thus, a day's worth of this valuable production had to be discarded. Unfortunately, to this date, this type of mixed messaging regarding masks is still going on. This was not a Democrat versus Republican issue. The vast majority of Republican governors encouraged the public to wear masks. Governor Charlie Baker of Massachusetts and Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland, both Republicans, even enacted a statewide mandate. Senator Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and Vice President Pence, both Republicans, to encourage the public to wear masks. And Senator Rand Paul has worn a mask when leaving the White House. The CDC advocated for wearing masks. At first, they stated parishioners should wear masks at church while singing. But after weeks of negotiating with the White House, they had to walk this back. The CDC then urged masks to be worn at large gatherings, such as protests and political events. But because of mixed messaging, this advice had reduced impact. And then there was our supply chain. Our supply chain was nothing short of a disaster. Initially, President Trump stated he was not a shipping clerk and governors needed to be in charge of procuring PPE supplies and tests. This resulted in governors bidding against each other and against the federal government, which caused huge increase in prices, much like on eBay. The LA Times reported the federal government was seizing supplies from hospitals. Robert Kraft, owner of the New England Patriots, bought for $2 million, 1.3 million masks from China, had them flown to New York City for transportation up to Massachusetts. Upon arrival in the United States, the federal government seized the shipment. Maryland's Governor Larry Hogan bought COVID-19 testing kits from South Korea and then flew them to Maryland where the Maryland National Guard took them to an undisclosed location, presumably to prevent them from being seized by the federal government. This was not a Republican or Democrat issue. Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland and Governor Charlie Baker of Massachusetts are both Republicans. This was just mass chaos, the results of which can be seen here. On January 21st, the United States had its first confirmed case of COVID-19, as did South Korea, and we both had approximately 4% unemployment. By May 11th, the United States had over 80,000 deaths, almost 15% unemployment. South Korea had 256 deaths and 4% unemployment. By June 19th, South Korea had 280 deaths, the United States almost 120,000 deaths. By September 20th, this had progressed to over 200,000 deaths in the United States, and South Korea had 383 deaths. A few states did have success stories. Governor Cuomo of New York State were able to drive downward infection rates in his state. This is one of the lowest levels in the nation. He implemented shutdowns, mandatory mask requirements, and social distancing. New York City still has a low rate of infections. And in New York State, the percentage of SARS-CoV-2 tests which are positive are under 1%. Governor Cuomo also enacted several innovative strategies by mandating a disjointed hospital system operated by a myriad of different corporations to work together. They shared staff, supplies, and ventilators. In some facilities, both hospitals and nursing homes, were designated as COVID-19 facilities. There were also some missteps, with nursing home patients who had COVID-19 that were hospitalized being discharged back to the nursing homes, but this was rapidly stopped. 
By the end of June, the United States had over 40,000 cases per day compared to the European Union with less than 5,000 cases per day, and the European Union has a larger population than the United States. By mid-September, the United States still has approximately 40,000 cases per day. However, several countries in the European Union have relaxed measures. Their populace has adopted the laissez-faire attitude towards restrictions, that of Americans, and unfortunately, they have shown a large increase in rebounding cases similar to the United States. In June of this year, the United States was having political rallies and numerous demonstrations. Shown here is an indoor rally for President Trump held in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The event was indoors. Participants were very close together. Few participants wore masks and it was held at a time when the coronavirus cases were skyrocketing in Oklahoma. The event is now suspected as being a super spreader event and possibly responsible for a subsequent surge in cases in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we apparently have not learned our lesson. In July, the Washington Post reported our healthcare workers are again running out of PPE. Two months later, the Associate Press reported that N95 masks were in short supply and there was a scarcity of materials for their manufacturing, that being of melt-blown textiles. The United States criticized CDC guidelines on school reopenings and created mixed messaging. The CDC resisted pressure to change its recommendations and just added references and supporting documentation to their guidance. In July of 2020, COVID-19 infection reporting was transferred from the CDC and NHSN to the Department of Health and Human Services. After several failures, the oversight and receipt of the reports was then restored back to the CDC. Finally, there were reports of White House officials trying to interfere with CDC morbidity and mortality reports. Since I've made these slides, there have also been a number of mixed messaging by the CDC regarding the effectiveness of masks, the need to test for asymptomatic carriers, and aerosolization of the virus. On August 24, 2020, under the pressure of the Department of Health and Human Services, the CDC changed their guidance on testing for asymptomatic carriers, stating that people without symptoms do not necessarily need a test. However, in a review of 16 SARS-CoV-2 outbreaks, Orrin and Topol found asymptomatic persons accounted for 40 to 45 percent of the infections. AMA President Susan Bailey stated, Suggesting that asymptomatic people don't need testing is just a prescription for community spread and further disease and death. Then on September 18th, it was reported that the CDC changed their guidance again and was recommending testing for asymptomatic individuals. Aerosolization is an important and highly dangerous mode of spread. On September 18th, 2020, the CDC stated the virus was airborne. This advisement would set the stage for a number of proactive strategies, such as the extended more frequent use of N95 masks and the upgrading of school and retail building ventilation systems. Three days later, this guidance was abruptly taken down from the CDC's website, stating draft recommendations had been posted in error and the website reverted back to its original wording. Now, with an R0 of 5.7, and having a virus which rapidly dissipates in an outdoor setting, aerosolization is very likely. This is also confirmed by a number of case reports and laboratory research. And it should be noted that this virus can live in aerosols for up to 16 hours. Now the case reports are shown here. They involve hospitals, they involve restaurants, and they also of course involve churches with singing. And activities such as singing, loud talking, screaming, all of these can aerosolize the virus. And I should add, as long as we've got some time, that as far as opening of schools, I feel very strongly that we need to have proper PEPE for teachers, 
who are our frontline workers. We need to have social distancing and paying attention to air quality and airflow. That is upgrading the air system so that we have healthy buildings. And that should be done regardless if we have COVID-19 or not. We need clean air, adequate airflow. The air should be sterilized. And that's important. Because as you all know, if you have kids in school, even before this, they were kind of a magnet for bringing home infectious diseases. A number of medications are used in patients with COVID-19. These include hydroxychloroquine, convalescent serum, monoclonal antibodies, rindisivir, anticoagulation, and dexamethasone. Hydroxychloroquine was initially approved by the FDA for emergency use. On June 15, 2020, after mounting evidence of being ineffective, the FDA withdrew its emergency authorization. Currently, there are five prospective randomized controlled trials which have not been able to demonstrate hydroxychloroquine's effectiveness. Three of these trials were double-blind and covered a wide range of clinical conditions from prophylaxis post-exposure to patients with severe COVID-19. This slide lists the five randomized controlled trials. A new laboratory study found that hydroxychloroquine works in monkeys, but not humans. The laboratory study which started the hydroxychloroquine movement had excellent results, demonstrating a 99% reduction in the SARS virus's replication, but it was performed on green monkey kidney cells. However, a recent study by Hoffman et al. demonstrated that the SARS-CoV-2 virus uses a different enzyme to enter human lung cells, and hydroxychloroquine does not block viral entry with this enzyme. Finally, the use of hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin makes little sense. Both prolong the QT interval and have added cardiac toxicity, producing in some patients fatal arrhythmias. With the frequent cardiac involvement and myocarditis caused by COVID-19, this is nothing less than a toxic mix. And why not focus on the drugs which are currently in human trials that block the enzyme which are found in humans? All of the effort spent on hydroxychloroquine would be better placed on more promising compounds. This is really inhibiting our efforts to cure COVID-19. The FDA oversold the results of convalescent serum. The 30% relative reduction in mortality was for patients given high-dose antibodies and within three days of diagnosis. This is a high bar to reach, and not too many patients will be able to fall into this category. There is just not enough convalescent serum. Eli Lilly has produced a neutralizing antibody product, which is in phase two randomized clinical trials. This product resulted in a 72% decrease in hospitalizations or ER visits. Similar to convalescent serum, the product has to be given within three days of diagnosis. If Eli Lilly can make enough of this product, it could become a bridge to a vaccine for newly diagnosed patients who are obese or who have advanced age and are the most likely to become hospitalized. Remdesivir may not be as promising as once thought. In a randomized prospective clinical trial using 10 days of remdesivir, COVID-19 patients' clinical status was not significantly different from controls. Clinical status was significantly improved using a five-day trial of remdesivir. However, the difference was of uncertain clinical importance. Thrombotic complications in critical ill COVID-19 ICU patients are of extreme importance. There is more than a 20% incidence of pulmonary embolisms and a 31% incidence of thrombotic complications in ICU patients with COVID-19. Because of this, some institutions are anticoagulating patients. There are currently clinical trials to determine if anticoagulation will increase survival. The recovery trial out of Oxford, England, found that low-dose dexamethasone reduced fatality rates by one-third in ventilator patients and one-fifth in patients receiving oxygen. 
there was no benefit found in patients not requiring respiratory support. A meta-analysis involving other studies has verified these findings. One of the hopeful bright spots in the United States is that of vaccine policy. It is progressing at warp speed. However, with goals set by the CDC and FDA for this fall, there has been concern over safety oversight. On average, it takes 30 months for a vaccine to complete phase three trials. The CDC set deadlines for preparations for distribution by November 1st, and the FDA felt that the vaccine possibly could be available and approved by November, providing everything goes well. Now, the FDA's Vaccine Safety Committee meets on October 22nd, 2020. The first vaccine, which I think will be out of the gate, will be the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and it's likely to be submitted for approval first. This is a U.S.-German vaccine collaborative, which also will have to be approved by Germany and the European Union. Thus, it should have multiple layers of safety oversight. One of the disturbing things of this vaccine is it's going to require storage and dry ice from the time of manufacture to distribution to the patient. This is unlike the flu vaccine, which just requires refrigeration. And as an aside, I think that this is going to be very problematic. We're not set up on a large scale to do this. And I think those with more health care resources and go to doctors which are not on necessarily the front lines will have more access to this type of complex distribution network. Thus, it may make disparities in healthcare worse. Now, to reassure the public, nine CEOs of major pharmaceutical corporations issued a pledge that they will not take safety shortcuts in producing a vaccine. However, this is a story which is still unfolding, and I suggest that everyone in attendance listen carefully to information being provided from multiple different sources. Now, I'd like to also note that HealthWatch USA has an abundant amount of resources regarding COVID-19. They can be accessed at healthwatchusa.org by clicking on the large coronavirus up at top or by selecting the COVID-19 drop-down menu. We have eight op-eds in major patients, 14 videos, meetings, and lectures, 107 radio shows, and 28 articles in infection control today, and four of those that are most read is the article that COVID-19 is primarily a heart disease, not a lung disease. That's a whole additional lecture that the flu could be either a dud or devastation. It's up to us that hydroxychloroquine works in monkeys, not human. Uh, that's based on laboratory research on which enzyme it works on, and also that herd immunity is a COVID-19 fallacy. There are also a number of continuing education courses. If you go to healthconference.org, we have a conference, Eyes Through the Front Line, which was an international conference, which had a number of notable international speakers, both Dr. Christine von der Brock Ross from the Netherlands. She's the editor of Antimicrobial Resistance and Infection Control. Dr. Jesus Rodriguez Banos, who is the associate editor of Clinical Microbiology and Infection, and also the immediate past president of the European Society for Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Disease, and Dr. Matthias Maivald, who is a very prominent infectious disease researcher from Singapore, and they will give you an international perspective. And we also have currently a continuing education course with, that has to deal on diagnosis, spread, and also opening of schools, which is being hosted by Southern Kentucky AHEC, and can be accessed through this uh, website. So I would like to conclude with this old adage, if we do not change our direction, we are likely to end up where we are headed. Thank you.